thank you very much for that wonderfully kind introduction. Uh, sitting here for the last hour plus, you've brought tears to my eyes and you've made me laugh, so I feel like I'm among friends. And I, of course, was born in Brooklyn and grew up in Queens, Jackson Heights, <laughs> 73rd Street and Northern Boulevard. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'm very glad to be here, but I'm also glad to be anywhere where I get to finish a sentence without getting interrupted. <laughs> uh, the uh, McLaughlin Group uh, definitely is a food fight. You're expected to speak before you think, and interrupting each other, being generally rude, calling each other names is all considered part of good television today. Uh, and I like to think of myself in that group, which is oriented to the right, that I am the voice of reason. It's a pretty lonely place on the group, and it's an increasingly lonely place in our politics today. When you have venerable organizations like Planned Parenthood demonized, and you have media outlets that seem more eager to take sides than report the news, and the information the public gets is often only loosely tethered to facts. You can see the challenges that the pro-choice community uh, faces. And to just recap some recent events, last week we saw the defeat of Senator Richard Lugar, uh, one of the last remaining moderate voices in the Republican Party, and uh, his challenger, Richard Murdoch, uh, won on his claim that there is too much bipartisanship in Washington. And he also went after Lugar's votes to confirm two of Supreme Court justices nominated by President Obama, Sandra Sotomayor and Elena Kagan. You can take Lugar's concession statement and the remarks made by Olympia Snow earlier this year when she decided she would not run again, put them side by side, and you can see the pressures facing uh, politicians today, particularly moderate Republican politicians. Senator Lugar noted the futility of either party, Republican or Democrat, getting their way in Washington after the election when big decisions must be made about extending tax cuts, about facing budget sequestration. Those big issues cannot be decided one by one party or the other because there's that little hurdle of getting 60 votes in the U.S. Senate. And Senator Snow expressed her frustration with demands of a party that really doesn't allow the kind of independence that made her an icon in uh, Maine. So their loss, and particularly Lugar's loss, and the fact that it turns so much on his votes for Supreme Court nominees, really will have a chilling effect on the next Congress. And if President Obama wins re-election, and it is an if, uh, Peter Hart, respected Democratic uh, pollster, sent out a memo to clients last week where he put the president's re-election at no better than 50-50, which made me realize that a lot of things can't be taken for granted in today's polarized political world. At the center of this election is the Supreme Court. I don't have to spell out to the people in this room how important it is to have a balance on the Supreme Court. President Obama is exceedingly proud, as well he should be, of the diversity he has helped bring the court with his two nominations. Uh, will any Republican in the next Senate cast a vote for a, an Obama nominee after the way Lugar was skewered by Richard Murdoch? It is really a, a, a challenge to get somebody on the Supreme Court. And if Mitt Romney does win, I think if we look at the way he governed in Massachusetts, I think I would say he's not too far right to make reasonable appointments. But will his party let him? How much maneuvering room will he have? And I look at the co-chair of the Romney Justice Advisory Committee, and it's Robert Bork. I, I don't have to explain who Robert Bork is to people in this room. His defeat in 1987, when he failed to win confirmation in the Senate. He was a Reagan appointee. 
it was over his interpretation of privacy. And to bork is now a verb. And his, his defeat actually launched the politicization of Supreme Court uh, justices. I think the fact that Romney has selected him uh, shows Romney's continued need really to placate his most far right uh, base. And for progressives, it really sends the signal that this is an all out war for the Supreme Court. Another element of our current political uh, landscape was the fight that we all watched over insurance coverage of contraceptives in the Affordable uh, Care Act. What a memorable day it was when Congress convened an all-male panel to discuss the issue. And bless her, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney said, where are the women? Humorist Andy Borowitz had great fun with that. He did a column imagining an all-female panel discussing erectile dysfunction. Um, <laughs> We got a lot of laughs, too, over the Virginia legislature mandating, wanting to mandate, transvaginal probes. Saturday Night Live's Amy Poehler said, transvaginal is my favorite airline. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many miles, I always get upgraded to lady business. <laughs> It was a good thing when the issue morphed into pop culture because the religious leg Virginia legislators were shamed and mocked and they tweaked the bill a bit, but it still passed. And in Pennsylvania, where they're considering similar legislation, along with another Virginia-inspired bill to require that the hallways in reproductive uh, services clinics be broadened and elevators be installed, which would mean that many of these clinics would be forced to close. Uh, that's being considered along with the, uh, the ultrasound legislation. And the governor in Pennsylvania said that the legislation, which is currently tabled but may still spring to life, is on the outside and not the inside. I mean, that's the tweaking they did. And he said if women don't like it, they should just close their eyes. So um, this is the kind of atmosphere that has um, erupted around the country. And in Pennsylvania, there are only 12 reliably pro-choice votes out of 253 legislators. And in the current congressional session, They've taken 26 votes on reproductive measures in the Pennsylvania House and eight in the Senate. And those are not to expand reproductive rights, they're to uh, limit them. And parenthetically, there aren't enough women in office. Of the 203 House members in Pennsylvania, only 32 are women, and 11 of the 50 uh, in the Senate are women. Not that all the women are pro-choice, but you have a better shot in a group of women to get a little bit more uh, progressive attitudes on this on this issues. 26 states around the country have enacted one or more anti-choice measures in since 2010 when the Republicans swept a lot of the state legislatures. And a lot of this is happening under the radar, but every so often something strikes a cultural nerve. And we saw that with the Susan B. Komen Foundation and their attempt to stop providing grants to Planned Parenthood because they were under apparent pressure from anti-choice uh, conservatives and funders. The reaction was fierce and fast, and Coleman, to their credit, scrambled back to rescue their credibility. They have not fully recovered, and I noted that this last week in Washington when they had their annual very well-received and very well-attended walk, that uh, Vice President Biden and, and his wife, uh, Jill, who traditionally kick off that walk in March, uh, politely declined, said they had a scheduling uh, conflict. The President's decision to publicly, to publicly endorse same-sex marriage draws another line in the sand. And, you know, I say this 
because these issues didn't always used to be Republican versus Democrat. Uh, and there are lots of Democrats who are not necessarily pro-choice and probably are not applauding the president's uh, most recent uh, announcement uh, either. But the party is able to accommodate this proverbial uh, big tent where the Republicans are becoming more and more hom hom homogeneous. Um, I think for Obama there is some political risk in some battleground states, uh, the decision that he made public but certainly the force of history is on his side. Uh, and I think it's a double tonic for both actually social conservatives and progressives. I think if Romney was gonna have any trouble rallying social progressives, the president just did it for him. Uh, but there will be, I think, an equal response on the, on the progressive side. And this is an election that will depend heavily on mobilization. And if the president is going to win re-election, he needs to reassemble the coalition that elected him in, in uh, 2008. So it could be a net positive. I mentioned Peter Hart's, I thought, fairly uh, gloomy uh, assessment of the race six months out. But he pointed out that in 08, it really was a crusade to elect Obama. And you know, we're not going to see that uh, uh, again. But one potential game changer, which uh, Peter Hart points out, is the Supreme Court decision on the Affordable Care Act, which is expected in, in June. Um, I think Democrats and supporters of the act are really nervous about how it's going to come out. It seemed initially that it would be a slam dunk that this would be declared constitutional when the arguments unfolded before the Supreme Court, the questioning was unusually harsh, and the response from the Solicitor General wasn't all that deft. So I think um, Democrats are beginning to fear the worst and beginning to prepare for the worst. Uh, Peter Hart says that a, a decision that declared the whole act unconstitutional or threw out the mandate could be, and this is his phrase, a catalyst for young people, poor people, and minorities uh, to vote. I, I, I think James Carville said it first, that if the Supreme Court throws out the Affordable Care Act, he, he basically said, let him do it, that would be great for a president's uh, re-election. Maybe this is just spinning, but history does show that a bitter law sometimes energizes the loser uh, more than the winner. Whatever the Supreme Court does, that is one of those uh, big moments in, that's going to help frame this election as we go into the summer. Hillary Clinton uh, spoke here in New York in March at the Women of the World Summit. And she made the point that extremists the world over, wherever they are and whatever their ideology, that they want to control women. And it's, it's really true when you, when you look around. And where that comes from, I think you probably have to get uh, ministers, rabbis, and uh, whoever together along with some psychiatrists. But, um, it certainly uh, is a phenomenon that we see everywhere. And the Violence Against Women Act is up for renewal. Uh, every woman in the Senate uh, uh, supported it, and that includes every Republican uh, woman. But that wasn't sort of the first time around. I mean, they had to be pressured to come out and defy uh, their own party. The men are not so eager about it, and now it's up for a vote in the, in the House. And, uh, the House leadership has stripped a number of provisions that uh, were added to update the, uh, the act to include uh, more groups that were not included the first time around and to include a confidentiality provision for women who uh, reported abuse who were illegal immigrants and didn't want to report, they didn't want to reveal themselves or the person they were bringing the complaint against. So they're trying to take that out in the, in, in, in the House of Representatives. And so this, again, is a, another campaign issue between the two sides. And the president, as you all know, is in New York today speaking at Barnard, and he's going to appear on The View, where uh, obviously he's going to, I believe, talk about women's health issues. Uh, the gender gap is huge at the moment. It's something like 18 points. And 
the Democrats have to keep that alive or they're not going to win. So I think uh, we can expect a lot of uh, promises made by the Democrats and a lot of scrambling on the part of the Republican candidate, Mitt Romney, to somehow say that um, he doesn't really represent uh, the party that we saw on stage during those primaries. And separating himself from his party is Romney's uh, big task. And the Obama uh, campaign is going to do everything they can to remind the public of all the positions that Romney took on his way to win the, uh, the nomination. A vigilant media and an engaged electorate are essential as we move into the next phase of this campaign. In the good old days, the period between now and summer and Labor Day, the candidates would sort of take a break. They can't afford to do that at all. I remember in 1988, after the convention, Michael Dukakis wanted nothing more than to go back and sleep in his own bed and tend to the affairs of, the, of state. He felt so guilty abandoning Massachusetts. He was the governor. He probably lost the election in that, in that period. This is going to be a close uh, race simply because of the function of today's politics. Uh, Romney is likely to name uh, Rob Portman, U.S. Senator from Ohio. He was George Bush's budget chief, which I would think would be a negative. <laughs> but he, he's very popular in Ohio. He's a, he's a grown-up. He, uh, and I think the, the, the thrust of the Romney, if it is Portman, or whatever, whoever Romney picks, um, it could even be Tim Pawlenty, is to double down on the fact that you know, they know how to manage the economy. Uh, Barack Obama is a nice man, good family man, but he's in over his head. Uh, if he picks Tim Pawlenty, can you imagine a more boring ticket? And Pawlenty is, he's actually a good guy, but he, he, he endorsed Romney immediately after dropping out of the race. And he did one of these dinners in Washington, and he said, you know, the re reason I endorsed Romney, you know, I, I like his policies, and, you know, he did well at the Olympics and all that. The reason I did is when I stand next to him, I'm the big edgy guy with the, with the oversized personality. <laughs> and in comparison, I'm the exciting one. So I think that if uh, whoever uh, Romney picks, he's going to go more for competence than for personality. No Sarah Palin <laughs> repeat. Uh, but there is great skepticism among voters about the viability of the American dream and whether it can be repeated for their children and, and grandchildren. And when you ask voters whether Obama has a clear plan for the economy, 36% say yes. When you ask them about whether Romney has a clear plan for the economy, he does even worse, 31%. So I don't think anybody quite knows the way out of the mess that we're in. And uh, I think the president feels the policies he's put in place uh, just need some more time. And Romney is claiming if he were uh, president, we would be much further along in the, in the recovery. But uh, Romney is broadly acceptable to the American people, and he's trying to define himself as a responsible conservative, while as I said, Obama is going to keep reminding voters of the more extremist positions that he took on his way to securing the nomination, including, as you saw in the video, his vow to, quote, get rid of uh, federal funding for Planned uh, Parenthood. The president has demographics on his side, a huge gender gap, 95-plus uh, confidence from African Americans, and I don't think they're going to abandon him even though uh, many are uncomfortable with his position on same-sex marriage. He's strong support among Hispanics and two-to-one among young people. But it's a wild card as to how many will actually get out and vote. If the economy is the same over the next six months as it's been the last two months, which is a very weak jobs growth, I think Obama is in uh, big trouble. Uh, I, I, I just read that George W. Bush was the first president to be reelected with an approval rating under 50% since Harry Truman. So that may be another uh, record that Obama might have to try to break. He has not cracked 50 and stayed there for any length of time for quite some time. 
He does win on likability over Romney, and that matters. But I think this election is going to be decided really on two things, that unemployment number, as faulty as it is, whether it's going down, uh, that's important for Obama, and then the debates. And they've announced three debates in October. Mark your calendars, October 3rd, October 16, and October 22. Uh, Romney has had a lot of experience in debates. The Republicans did 20 of them. Uh, but there's a lot, certainly a lot, riding on this, on this election. And I want to close with something that Vernon Jordan uh, said recently. I, I think people in this room know who Vernon is, the former head of the Urban League, a uh, good friend to President uh, Clinton. And I knew him way back when, when I was just learning to be a reporter in Atlanta, uh, Georgia. Uh, Vernon says that uh, Obama's re-election is more important than his election because America is about reaffirmation. And I think that can also be said about the goals and the principles and the values that we've heard expressed here today. They too are fragile and must be constantly reaffirmed. Thanks so much for having me.